It's good to see you today. Ginger and I are truly thankful that we've had the opportunity to be with you over these last few weeks, and particularly today. It's just a blessing to be here. Uh, lovely singing, uh, well-led, uh, prayers, readings, absolutely a great way to glorify and praise the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're thankful for you in so many ways. Continue to pray for those folks in Ukraine as the young man led us just a moment ago. And I mentioned at Bible class time that Mark Posey, the preacher, longtime preacher at Austinville in Decatur, and now preacher and elder down at Winfield, Alabama, is uh, he's in Poland right now as far as we know. I mean, I know he's in Poland, but I don't think he's left yet to, to come home. But he should be home in a few days. But he was over there doing mission work for about 30 days. He goes over every year, and he has done so for about 30 years. And Mark loves those people. And uh, we're, we're glad that he was able to get out of Ukraine and into Poland so that he could uh, make his way home safely. But uh, Brother Mark Posey is the fellow we're talking about. Somebody asked me one time, uh, Joe asked me, what, what's your best sermon? I said, <laughs> yeah, that's tough. That's tough. I only have two sermons. Uh, I, have, I have one about becoming a Christian, and the other one is about remaining a Christian. And I kind of divide those up over, over the period of weeks. Uh, that, that might sound a little jokey to you, but I'd like for you to think about that, about uh, most of the preachers you listen to. Either they're talking about becoming a Christian or how to remain a faithful Christian. And that's really what it boils down to. The Apostle Paul, for an example, had a tremendous interest in the church at Rome. And we know that there were Romans in Pentecost on the day of Pentecost because it's mentioned there by Luke in, in Acts chapter 2 that Romans were there. Perhaps that's how the church was started in that place. And his letter to the Romans, uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, is masterful on many levels. It provides a presentation of the gospel itself that's really w without equal in the letters uh, in Romans uh, chapters 1 through 11. That's sort of Paul's version of the gospel. Not that it changes any way from any of the other versions of the gospel, but it's his presentation of the gospel, going through a number of very important and significant elements in the description of the gospel. And then the last part of the letter to the Romans, uh, uh, chapters 12 through 16, is very practical, application. And a person can, can look at that letter uh, every day. And, and grow by it. As children of God, we can get stronger and better and, and just move along in a positive direction as we study to show ourselves approved unto God, the workmen that need not be ashamed, handling right the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. We find that the book of Romans is it's almost like an encyclopedia of how to maintain oneself as a child of God. Therefore, I'm thinking about what we're talking about this morning as a lesson about the continual condition of the Christian. The continual condition of the Christian. This idea of the Christian life being a continual thing is a very significant idea, and it's tied up in a lot of passages of Scripture, and sometimes even in the grammar of passages in Scripture that we love and we care about and it means so much to us. For example... In 1 John chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 5, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Verse 6 of 1 John chapter 1 says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves, the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 7, as you will remember, of course, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another because we're all walking in the light together. 
And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And you've heard preachers say over the years, and of course it's, it really is uh, the honest truth, that that blood just keeps on cleansing us. That's the, that ending on, in the King James ETH keeps on cleans, cleanseth us. It just keeps on cleansing us as we walk in the light as he is in the light. And the, the English Standard Version even say continues to cleanse us. And the blood does that. But the book of Romans deals with this subject too. Uh, very much so. I, I mentioned it before, but I have a connection with this chapter that I, that I can never forget. And I hope you don't mind me mentioning it. But on a Tuesday afternoon in September of 1975, I was reading Romans chapter 6 and uh, began to think even more seriously about it. And that evening, after I went over to Ginger's house, we weren't married then, weren't even engaged, and I'm not even sure she wanted to put up with me that much. But anyway, I was over there, and we went, uh, went and had a Bible, we had a Bible study at her apartment and ultimately baptized into Christ downtown in Atlanta. And it was after that that I read... Uh, this this chapter that I knew that I had to obey the gospel. Romans chapter 6 taught me that it was important and absolutely important and important in an infinite way to obey the gospel of Christ. But it's not just about obeying the gospel. There are a number of things mentioned in this chapter that can be helpful to us. You could even make a little note in the margin uh, about each section of Romans chapter 6. The first six verses, these verses describe the change in condition experienced by people who become Christians. Every one of us in here is already a Christian, and I suspect many of us in here are already Christians. Every one of us has experienced the same change in condition when we obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we came to believe that Jesus is the Christ and to turn away from our sin, to confess him as the Christ and uh, to be baptized into him, to be raised to walk in this newness of life. Look at these first six verses. He says, what shall we say then? It's reading from New King James. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not or, or absolutely not or uh, God forbid a strong negative. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Then he says, or do you not know? That as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Passage that was read for us earlier. Now we know that Paul was encouraging Roman Christians to remain faithful. Because the way the letter is written, it's obvious that he's writing to people who are already Christians. He's encouraged them to remain faithful. But the pro excuse me, the problem has come up that some of these people had had developed an idea that was contrary to their own spiritual health. The idea that they developed was that since I'm saved by grace and God's grace and love and mercy saves me, then it really won't matter what I do in my life. I can be, quite frankly, as sinful as I'd like to be and then just tell God I'm sorry and His grace will cover me. Well, you know, when we do sin as a Christian... If we truly repent of our sins, God does forgive us of those sins. But the problem that Paul is dealing with here is the idea that some people had that they could continue in sin that grace might abound. They had the wrong idea about it. And so in order to disabuse them of that notion, he reminds them of what they did when they obeyed the gospel. And it's helpful for all of us as Christians to go back from time to time in our mind's eye and think about the day that we obeyed the gospel. Think about the, your situation, what you were thinking about before you did that and what you were thinking about after you did that 
And so what Paul does that for them here, he wants them to think about it. Some, some of these Christians at Rome evidently thought that grace would cover them no matter what. And Paul says, no, that's not it. He asked them to remember something. That they had changed their condition when they obeyed the gospel. Every, every person who, I, I don't know what your story is, Perhaps you were raised up around the church. You know, we talk about raised in the church. We, we raised up around it, really. Perhaps you were, and that, boy, what a tremendous blessing. I talk, Jimmy Clark and I talk all the time. Jimmy was, you know, raised, he was raised at Winford and Polly's house. Y'all may remember Winford Clark. Well, that had to be quite an experience to be raised there. But anyway, he was raised up in a different environment than I was. He was raised up knowing, being taught things that you've taught your children probably. All your life, things that Ginger and I have taught our children. But I wasn't. I was raised up in a different environment. It was, it was fine. The people were good. My parents were good to us, but it was a different environment. But it helps me to go back and remember. I found out by talking to people like Jimmy and, and faithful Christians that it helps everybody to go back and think about the change in condition. See, before... And we need to remember that sometimes we, we get a little weak on this, I think, sometimes. Sometimes we need to remember that before we obeyed the gospel, before Jesus' blood was applied to our sin-stained souls, we were lost. You know, before September 1975, I was a lost man. There was no merit to it for me, nothing about it at all. I was just lost. And had I, you know, according to what the Bible says, people say, well, you can't be sure. Well, listen, I, I, I might not be able to be sure of uh, the answer to every question that might be asked in eternity of the Lord. I'm not going to say that I know, uh, but I do know what the Bible says. I know the Bible teaches that before I obeyed the gospel, I was a lost person. As a matter of fact, when... He, he speaks here of being a servant or a slave of sin. I know that's what I was. What about you? What about you? Before you obeyed the gospel, were you a slave to sin? I was. Now let me ask you this. Is anybody here today that's a slave to sin right now? It could be that you're visiting here. You've never thought about this. It's it's not something you put a lot of time and energy and effort into. But let me, let me remind you of something. And Paul's going to mention this here in the second part of Romans 6. Because he's going to be talking about that the changed condition that the Christian is in is an improved condition. It's not only changed, it's improved. Because you go from being a servant of sin to a servant of God. An old, old song from the 70s or 80s, I believe, it said, everybody's going to serve somebody. As, as part of the, you know, the gospel retinue that sometimes you'll hear on the radio. Everybody serves somebody. You're either going to serve God or you're going to serve Satan in one form or another. But the situation that a Christian is in, we are in an improved situation. Our condition is improved. Pick up with verse 7 of Romans 6. He says, For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, when we're baptized into Christ, we died with Christ. Having been raised from the dead, we shall, if, been, if we died with him, we're going to live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. See, when you, the, the idea is when, when Jesus went to the cross, when he died, that was the one sacrifice. Hebrews 9, 27. Uh, Hebrews 8, Hebrews 10. There was one sacrifice that took care of everybody's sin. Everybody's sin from before him to after him. He died for everybody's sin. That all that sin was eradicated in principle by the one death of Jesus Christ. When, therefore, like in like manner, when, I, when you and I obey the gospel and we're baptized into Christ, we're baptized into his death, it says here in Romans 6. 
baptized into his death, that's the one death to sin that we experience. It doesn't mean that we, we don't have work to do. We have plenty of work to do, but that is the death to sin that we experience. Now, we are freed from sin when, we're, when we are baptized into Christ. Sin doesn't have a hold on us. Imagine sin having big, strong chains or big leather uh, uh, straps on, hooked onto you, hooked onto your soul, and that's, that's the way you live your life if you live your life without Christ. You are always tied to sin. And when you're baptized into Christ, baptized into his death, all that's taken away. And people got that part of it. But what they didn't get, Paul was saying, is that they had a continual responsibility. This improved condition of being freed from sin, it doesn't mean that the Christian is no longer capable of sin. We are capable of sin. But we don't have to sin. We don't continue in sin. We continue in life. We continue to walk in the light. We don't continue to walk in darkness. Do we ever find ourselves in darkness from time to time? Well, certainly we do. First John tells us that. We've already read that passage. If we say that we have no sin, we lie. The truth's not in us. But what Paul is telling us here is, that the child of God goes through this change of condition and it's an improved condition and we have a responsibility to maintain ourselves in that improved condition. The Christian, though we are susceptible to sin, and we do, we're not tied to it. We're not bound to it. We're not a slave to sin. Uh, David saying, Y'all know David. David illustrates it this way. The person who is in the world, out there in the world, no Christianity associated therewith, that person wakes up every day, and part of his day is what's he going to do that's sinful that day? What's he going to do that's going to be a, uh, an act of pleasure for the flesh or whatever it is? But the Christian, when you wake up every day, you, you don't wake up trying to figure out what you're going to do sinful that day. You try to think about what you're going to do that's righteous. You don't continue. We're not continuing in sin. This is a much improved condition that the child of God is in. In third place, Paul takes great pains to point out that the Christian's condition is a responsible condition. It's, it's improved, it's changed, it's improved, and it's responsible. He said there in verses 12 and 13 of chapter 6, he says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. In other words, whose responsibility is it to keep me from allowing sin to reign or, allow, uh, or put me in a position where I'm continuing to be in sin? Whose responsibility is it to keep me from doing that? It's mine. That's my responsibility. Somebody said, well, I, you know, grace, God's going to take care. No, wait. God's grace provides that which we must have for our sins to be remitted. His grace does not make us do what's right even if we're not ready to do what's right. God does not obviate the free will moral agency of any of us. Somebody says, why is, why is Vladimir Putin? I'm praying for him too, brother. Well, why is Putin acting the way he is? Because he's a man of the world. It's might makes right in the world. And Vladimir Putin's not the only politician in the world who thinks like that. A lot of them on our side think that way too. God's grace and mercy is not going to make somebody straighten up and fly right. That's what my daddy always told me. He said, boy, you better straighten up and fly right. And I learned later what, well, he took some actual steps to make sure I understood that. I won't go into it any further. But Paul makes the point here. Our situation, our condition is a responsible. Do not let, this, do not 
let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Don't yield your members, your body, your arms, legs, your ears, your everything about you. Don't yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but yield yourselves to God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. I tell you, it's hard these days. I think about Caleb talking about these kids tonight going out to Fairview. What a wonderful blessing for them to all be together and to, to praise the Lord together and all that sort of thing. Let me tell you something. Folks, we just need to remember, uh, when I was a kid, we had three channels. We had ABC, uh, NBC, and CBS most of the time. Sometimes they went off, depending on how old the tubes were and, and, and so forth at the broadcast station. And you know you could watch that television 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you'd never see a pornographic picture. Now, you, y'all that are my age, you know, in your 60s and up, isn't that the truth? You could watch broadcast television. You'd never see immorality. You'd never see pornography. You'd never see adultery portrayed as an ideal circumstance. Of course, things have changed, haven't they? You see a lot of stuff now on television. I'm talking about regular television, not even, not even cable television. And our kids are dropped into this big mess, and they've got to deal with it. And some of them are so young, it's hard for them to deal with it. It's tempting, that sin out there. We have to help them. The Christian is expected by God, and this is true for you kids too. We are expected to control our members that are upon this earth. In other words, we're expected to control our bodies. We have to put ourselves under control. And folks will say, well, that's awful hard to do. I don't think I can do it. Well, you can do it. Listen, if one person can do it, anybody can do it. Everybody can do it. You have to want to do it. But we have to work at it. Now, people in Christian work, in the Christian state of the Christian religion today is don't talk about working because it's got to be all grace. I've had so many of my friends that some of them even left the church because they said, well, you, you always talking about what you've got to do. I don't believe you've got to do anything. Jesus has done it all. The Lord has done it all. Well, he's provided the means of our salvation 100%. But he expects us to behave ourselves. Isn't that right? What should we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And Paul goes on to say in this chapter that we have a new continual condition. Verse 15 says, What then shall we sin? Because we're not under law, but under grace, certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are to that one, you're that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered unto you, and that Obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered unto you. The doctrine is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, you can just put this aside sometime because somebody's going to ask you, how do you know baptism's required? If you want to obey from the heart the form of doctrine delivered unto you, you'll submit to being immersed in water for the remission of your sins. The form of doctrine. What's the doctrine? The doctrine of the, the capital doctrine of Christianity is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Isn't that correct? And how is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ formed? What form does it take in doctrine? Baptism. Death, burial, resurrection. Raised, 
to walk in newness of life. Now, the child of God, you and I are not masters waiting to be served. We are servants looking for a way to please God. And what he wants us to do is to, in a voluntary way, give ourselves in service to him. We entered into this voluntary servitude when we obeyed from the heart the outline or the form of the doctrine. This death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And the outline, the form or pattern of it is baptism into Christ, as is mentioned in the first six verses of the chapter. And we do this of our own free will because we believe the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So one of the reasons that I love this passage and I'll, I'll always preach on it is that when you go through Romans chapter 6 and you put yourself in the pew of Christians at Rome, you can see that they were being reminded of what they did and what they did, the implications of what they did for what they were doing and for the blessings that they would experience because of what they did. And it all goes back to what Jesus did. But we have to be servants of sin. The continual, the continual condition of the child of God is that of a servant or a slave of God. Now, in our world today, folks say, well, wait a minute. I don't like the idea of being a slave or a servant. It's bad, it's wrong, it's terrible. Well, it is, but you are. Everybody serves somebody. I said it once, I'm saying it again, and know that you might remember. everybody serves somebody. You say, Well, I'm not anybody's servant. What are you going to do in the morning? Well, I'm going to go to work. Why? Won't you just get those folks to pay you without you going? Well, they won't do that. Well, I know they won't. But why don't you? You know, you, you're not serving anybody. Of course you're serving somebody. You serve every. If, if you're a husband, you're a servant. If you're a wife, you're a servant. If you're a child, you're a servant. If you're a teacher, you're a servant. If you're a student, you're a servant. If you're a soldier, you're a servant, Romans 13. If you're a policeman, you're a servant. If you're a mama, you're a servant, aren't you? Boy, you serve, don't you? Everybody serves somebody. What we have to avoid is don't serve the rotten fruit of sinfulness. Instead, serve the beautiful fruit of righteousness as Paul says down here in Romans 6 verse 20 he says for when you were slaves of sin you were free in regard to righteousness I remember when I was a sinning a boy I didn't care about righteousness somebody said you know you shouldn't do that I said why not I can do what I want to do nobody's going to tell me what to do I found out later that God will tell you he'll tell you he'll tell you now he'll tell you then Verse 21, it says, What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. When Verse 21, he says, For what fruit did you have then that you're now ashamed of? Now I'm going to ask you, boy, I can't ask these women this question, but I can ask these men this question. And fellas, I want you to look back in your life and make a short list of things that you did before you became a faithful Christian that you're ashamed of right now. You women can do that too, but I mean, I can, I can identify with the fellas better. I'm telling you, I'll tell you the truth, I've told Ginger this, there are days that go by sometimes I can't get off my mind the fact that I'm so thankful to God that He has forgiven me for the thing, the rotten fruit 
that I laid at his feet. You know, and aren't we all going we, we'll all agree one thing. We'll never lay any more rotten fruit to his feet if we can help it. Because we want to be faithful children of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so as we thought about Romans chapter 6, the continual condition of the child of God, that we're saved, we're, we're faithful. Let me ask you just, I'll just, it's just very simple. Really? What is your condition? What is your condition spiritually? Now, if you're a faithful child of God, God bless you. It's wonderful. You don't have to be perfect. You can't be some sort of uh, sinless paragon. You're not capable of that. But if you're a faithful Christian, that is, when you sin, you repent of that sin. If you're a faithful child of God, God bless you. Everything's wonderful, lovely. That's what we're here for. We want a room full of faithful Christians. Unless they're too young to be. But if you know that if uh, something were to happen to you, you wouldn't have any hope. Don't waste any time. I'm going to tell you something. You ain't got time to waste. Nobody does. I could take three steps right over here and be gone. You could too. I was preaching in this very pulpit Years ago, we got word that a man working on a farm died. An important man to this congregation. You may remember that. We don't know things, folks. I'm not trying to scare anybody. What I want to see happen is if anybody needs to become a Christian, they need to do it. And if anybody needs to come back to the Lord, they must do it. Because that's what God wants, and that's the blessing for your life at this time. So if you need to respond to God's gospel call, would you come as together we stand and sing?